two masses, three springs. So we're going to start talking about coupled oscillators. Um, and you'll notice Taylor starts with a fairly simple uh, situation, uh, and it has rich behavior, even though it's a simple situation. Hey, physics ha does that all the time. So to, uh, to dig in. All right, so first of all, to set up our situation, we have a wall, we have a spring, we have a mass, which we will call M1, and this spring has spring constant K1. Um, and then we will have another mass, M2. This, I think, is falling. This spring has constant K2, and another spring that has constant K3, and another wall. And I'm going to define some positions here, and I'm going to do it a little differently from how he did, so we can be explicit about how it all works out. I'm going to define X1 as the position of the first mass, and X2 as the position of the second mass, and L as the length between the walls. And so now you can figure out the forces on the two masses. So uh, mass one, it's going to have a spring force that way and a spring force that way, right? Now, Hooke's law. Hooke's law is not just it's linear. Some of you said, oh, it means it's linear. No, Hooke's law is more than that. Hooke's law says F sub X equals minus KX. Um, restoring force, right? Hooke's law means linear restoring force. Um, another way of saying it is that the potential energy is one half kx squared. Now, what does this mean? This means the displacement from equilibrium, right? So you have to be a little careful about that. And then this negative, and notice it's not f equals minus kx, it's f sub x because um, it's the x component of force here, right? If we were talking magnitudes of forces, you would have to say um, f equals k times the absolute value of x, right? Um, and in fact, at this point, you could make it f equals k times the absolute value of the displacement from equilibrium of the thing, because now we're talking magnitudes of forces, right? So positive numbers. So that negative, this is something I think in physics we're not anal enough about when we're talking vectors versus components versus magnitudes. And the result is at the end, we end up making a bunch of sign errors because we were sloppy about when we were talking about magnitudes and when we weren't. All right, so Hooke's law basically is that, um, you know, with our Lagrangians and energies and all that, maybe this nowadays I would think is the best way to think about it. Um, because uh, I don't know, whatever. In any event, and so knowing this and then knowing that the direction is, well, all right, let's go ahead and be fully anal about this. If I have some guy here and this is its equilibrium position, so that's the R vector, then the force has to be, it's going to have magnitude KR, right? So now R is the magnitude of the R vector, so it's never negative. And it's got to be in the minus r hat direction, right? If r is the displacement from equilibrium, the force pushes it back towards the equilibrium. So this is maybe the safest way to say Hooke's law. Okay, so all of that aside, so now what we can do, let me clean this up a little bit. All right, so I've drawn a free body diagram here. And so we know, in this case, what the magnitudes of these two forces are. I'm just going to write the magnitudes, and then I'll worry about the sign later. So this one is going to be k1 times x1 minus L10, so I'm defining L10 is the equilibrium length of spring one, and this is gonna be K2 times the length of spring two, the length of spring two is X2 minus X1, right? And then minus its equilibrium length. Those are the magnitudes. Now, I have to worry about signs, and in particular, by drawing these arrows the way I did, I have asserted that, um, K1 has to be to the left and K2 has to be to the right. So what you can do is think about it physically. Let's go up. Um, let's go up here and think under what circumstances will that spring pull to the left? And it's when the spring is stretched. That's when X1 minus L1 zero is greater than zero. So this really needs to be positive there, right? Right, because on my free body diagram, I drew the force to the left. For the arrow to be in that direction, I have to have x1 greater than l0 because that will physically be the spring pulling to the left. So now let's do this other one here, to the right. Under what circumstances does the spring pull to the right? Um, well, so now that's this spring. It will pull m1 to the right when the spring is stretched, right? Because if the spring is squished, it'll try to push m1 back. So it's going to pull M1 to the right when the spring is stretched. 
that's going to happen when its length is longer than its equilibrium length, and that's already what this says. So this is also a plus. So the way I've drawn this free body diagram, both of these are pluses. And so now the x component of force on the first object is just minus k1. Wait, I thought you said it was plus. Well, one moment. Let me write it first. Um, plus k2 times x2 minus x1 minus L0. All right. It was plus, but notice I drew this arrow to the left. And so if I make that my x direction, and we'll make that z, and we'll make y into the page for no good reason, because we don't even need y and z here. It's one dimensional. If x is to the right, then when I drew the arrow force here to the left, that means it's a negative force in the plus x direction, right? So that's fx1. So hold on to this thought. I'll write it down in a little bit, but I want to do uh, number two next. All right, so if I draw a free body diagram for number two, it's also going to have a, th a spring in each direction. Let's start with the magnitudes. Well, this magnitude is going to be um, equal to um, the spring constant for spring three, because that's what's on the right side here, um, times the length of spring three. What is the length of spring three? That's L minus X2, right? Minus its equilibrium length, L3, zero, right? So L minus X2 is just how long the spring is. It's, it's current physical length, and I subtract off the equilibrium length. And then to the left, it's going to have a K2, and we'll worry about the signs in a minute, just like we did before. X2 minus X1 is the length of spring 2, and we have to subtract off K, or sorry, L2, 0 in that case. Now let's think about signs. Let's start to the left. Under what circumstances will the spring to the left push M2 to the right? That's when the spring is squished when its length is less than L2, 0, right? So that means that it'll push it to the right when that thing is negative. But no, oh, actually, I should have been asking to the left here, right? So I have this arrow to the left. Under what circumstances will it pull it to the left? All right, so I said it wrong. Um, go back up here. This spring will pull this mass to the left when the spring is stretched, right? When it's stretched, it'll pull it to the left. So that means we actually do want a positive on here because that's going to, when this thing is positive here, that means that the length is longer than the equilibrium length. And so it's stretched. And when it's stretched, it'll pull it to the left. Fine. And now let's look at the side on the right. Under what circumstances will it pull it to the right? That's also when the spring is stretched, right? Because if it was squished, it'd push it back to the left. And this here is the length of the spring minus its equilibrium length. So when that is positive, the spring is stretched, and that's when it pulls it to the right. So this should be a plus also. So now we have F2x is equal to minus K2 again, because I drew this guy to the left. It's in the minus X direction. So I have to flip the sign here when I write down the force X component of force times X2 minus X1 minus L2, 0 plus K3 times capital L minus X2 minus L3, 0. Right? So now that I have those two forces, um, I want to start thinking about, you know, I'm, I'm done with my free body diagram. I'm done with coming up with the uh, forces. I want to start thinking about what are the equations of motion. All right, so just to write them down again. Okay, so these are the two force equations I came up with. Um, and then we're going to just say F1x is equal to M1 X1 double dot, right? Newton's laws and F2x is equal to M2x2 double dot. And, um, and then we want to solve it. Now, you remember the way Taylor did this is he got this into this nice matrix form. And it's not going to work here because we're going to have these leftover constants floating around. And so we're not going to be able to write some matrix with M's in it times x1 double dot x2 double dot is equal to some matrix with k's in it times x1 x2 because I need to have a plus constant on the end and that's going to mess up all of this eigenvalue stuff. Well, okay, Taylor asserts and then tells you it is you to show it in problem 11.1 .1, that if instead of um, instead of the x1 and x2 I have here, we write, we use the variables, the displacement moment of m1 from equilibrium and m2 from equilibrium as our variables, we get the form we want. Now, here's the problem. Um, x1 equilibrium is not just L0, right? That's what it would be 
um, in the case where you just have one spring, then X1 equilibrium is L0. But X1 equilibrium is not just L0, so I can't just substitute this for X1 equilibrium and be done with it. So really what I have to do to find the equilibrium is solve F1X equals 0 and F2X equals 0 simultaneously and figure out what X1 and X2 are. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. All right, so here's my maxima. I will put this maxima file online so you can refer to it later. I start by killing everybody, because that's how you should always start. Um, <laughs> this reminds me, I'm going to total off topic aside here. Uh, when I was at Quest University, um, we uh, it, they stopped doing it after the first few years because the student body got too big. But my first couple of years, we didn't have a full size student body yet. And we would have this Christmas dinner where the entire school would get together in the cafeteria and I'll have a kind of nice dinner all together. And one of the things that... Uh, they did is students would uh, stand up and try and imitate one of the professors and people had to guess who the professor was. And so one guy stood up and he says, okay, so we want to find out what the force between these two galaxies is. So first we kill everybody in the room and everyone laughed, right? So, because I, I have this tendency to talk like that, whatever. So first of all, I'm going to write down, these are the two equations that we just had, um, F1X, uh, F2X, and you can check. In fact, here, I'll go ahead and can enter on them. And uh, here you can see these equations are exactly what I had before. They may not be in exactly the same order. And now, problem 11.1. Let's find where these two guys are at equilibrium. And boom, here they are. And now you can see why I'm glad that I didn't do the algebra by hand. Um, because I could have done it. But look at all these terms. Almost certainly, I would have made 10 million sign errors, which is pretty amazing since there's a lot less than 10 million terms here. And yet, and yet I would have made um, orders of magnitude more sign errors than there are terms because that's how sign errors work. So I've got these equilibrium positions um, and they're long, but whatever, I've got them. So now I can work with them. So I'm going to pull them out. And just to remind you, notice here, when you say solve, it returns a list of a list. The outer list, so this outer bracket here, gives you the different solutions, because sometimes you have multiple solutions, right? Think quadratic equation. In this case, we don't. There's only one element in the outer list. Then the inner list has the um, variables for that one solution. So this inner list has two elements, which are the two solutions. Now, if there had been more than one solution there here, there would have been a comma and then brackets and then the list of variables for the second solution. And then notice it gives the solution as x1 equals the value. So if I want to just pull that value out here, that's what this thing is here. So x1, x2 at eq, that's what I, I just defined this variable because I didn't want to use a percent O because I'm, I don't want to be, I'm not confident that it would be the same percent O next time I ran this. So you want to define variables like that. Um, I'm going to take the first solution, first set of x1, x2, because there only was one, and then one here gives me the x1 solution, and I just want the right-hand side of the equation, so we do RHS, right? And then for x2, 0, the equilibrium position of x2, um, I use the first solution, and then the second element that, of that list is the x2 solution. So notice when I do that, boom, here's x1, 0, and here's x2, 0. Um, and they're long, but whatever. And now, I want to make substitutions of the dynamic variables. So the substitution I want to do is I'm going to define a new variable xi sub 1, which turns out I did it this way, and then later I realized that Taylor used xi for something else. So you're just going to have to cope. Um, I'm going to make xi sub 1 equal to x1 minus x10, right? So xi sub 1 is defined as the position of the first mass relative to its equilibrium. Xi1 equals x1 minus x10. Of course, the substitution I want to do is to get rid of x1. So you have to solve for x1, and that's in the substitution command for maxima. And likewise, um, xi2 is x2 minus x20, so that gives you this. So I'm going to substitute both of those into my two force equations, and I get this unholy mess. And you think, how did that help? Well, rat simp. Always try rat simping stuff. When I rat simp them, look at that. They're very nice. Notice I don't have any constants anymore. I just have k's times xi's, and that's what we were looking for. All right. So, hey, we have exactly equation 11.2. Isn't that nice?
All right, so here we go. You can see that I have already written out uh, the equations. Um, these are the ones that we got from Maxima, although they're just <laughs> what Taylor had, right? It's what you would have done if we had started with off of equilibrium position to start with. Although Taylor did assume that the springs were all at equilibrium when the masses were at equilibrium positions, and we did not assume that here. So it's possible that all three springs were a little squished when the masses are at equilibrium position, and yet we still get these equations. That was the point of doing all of this. And the other thing is we've just collected it together, so it's constants times i1 plus constants times i2 for both of them. All right, now, note, as an aside, if for no adequately explained reason, we decided to write xi1 is equal to psi1 plus complex number, imaginary number i times phi1. Right. If we wanted to do that, well, then psi1 double dot would just be psi1 double dot plus i times phi1 double dot, right? Let's substitute that back into this first equation. Um, by the way, before I do that, I want to do one other thing. I'm going to do the same thing with xi2, right? And the psi2 double dot works also. So let's substitute both of these back into the first equation. I get m1 times psi1 double dot plus i phi1 double dot um, is equal to minus k1 plus k2 times psi1 plus i phi1 plus k2 times psi1 plus i phi1. Or if I recollect things a little differently, I say m1 psi1 double dot plus i times m1 phi1 double dot is equal to minus k1 plus k2 psi1 plus k2 psi1 plus, I'm doing this on purpose, i times brackets minus k1 plus k2 phi1 plus k2 phi1 brackets. All I did was just recollect the terms a little bit, but now if you look at this, notice that if I just look at this term by itself, and what is that term? That's the real part of this equation. For this equation to work, the real parts have to match and the imaginary parts have to match. Right? So there are the real parts, and then here are the imaginary parts, that one, that one, right? Well, what for the real parts to match and for the imaginary parts to match, um, what we need to have is that psi1 and phi1 are each solutions. Right, so uh, psi1 is a possible solution and phi1 is a possible solution. So why am I doing this? Because uh, I know where I'm going trying to get where Taylor did. All I'm doing so far is that if I make, and, and in fact, you probably should have known this a priori, because what is this? I'm saying it. it's a linear combination of two things. And because these are linear differential equations, a linear combination of solutions is itself a solution, right? I have just chosen this particular linear combination of solutions, right? So given that I'm doing this particular linear combination of solutions, let's try the solutions that we know we want to get, right? So you do differential equations. We're going to try psi1 is equal to alpha1 times cosine omega t plus delta1. And psi2 is equal to alpha2 cosine. So we're going to try a cosine solution. You know, the way Taylor says it, nothing is stopping me from trying this, right? We could try anything, right? I could try psi1 is equal to t squared plus uh, um, the hyperbolic sine of t plus uh, the square root of t cubed minus smiley face, right? You can try whatever solution you want, um, and you will discover for most of them that they don't satisfy the differential equation, so you know they're not really a solution. So what we're doing is trying this solution to see if it satisfies the differential equation, um, and we're motivating it by the fact that we actually know it will work. And let's also try phi1 is alpha1, and it's going to be the same alpha1 times sine omega t plus the same delta 1, and phi 2 is alpha 2 sine omega t plus delta 2, 
right? We're going to try those solutions. Now, here's the thing to notice about this. This and this are linearly independent, right? It's cosine of one argument and sine of the same argument. Um, they're linear independent, linearly independent in that if you integrate them from minus infinity to infinity times each other, you get zero, whatever. It's like an inner product. Um, so these are independent solutions we're trying. And since this is a second order differential equation, if both of these solutions work, then we know we found all of them, right? Because you only need two different independent solutions. And we will have two constants, um, right? Alpha one and delta one. Um, so, and then, and then out, psi two goes with psi one and phi two goes with phi two, right? So we will have the two independent solutions if this works. But notice the neat thing about this is the way I've written this is that psi one plus i times phi one is just equal to alpha one times e to the i times omega t plus delta one. And then the same thing applies for, for uh, psi two plus i phi two, right? And that just works. Remember, e to the i x is equal to cosine x plus i sine x. Guess whose formula that is? Euler's, just like everything else, um, right? So this, always remember this, e to the ix, sinusoids. So if I try these solutions that I'm trying over here, I can e equivalently write it like this. And then motivated by what I did before, psi1 plus i1 is a solution, I can plug in just this piece into the equation all by itself. If it works, then psi1 and phi1 both work. So what I'm going to do now is try um, xi1 and xi2 of those forms and plug them into the DEs and see what happens. Uh, actually, one thing before I do that, let me make a little bit of space. Um, as an aside, um, this looks very much like something we did in the rotational chapter, uh, where we had uh, two different axes uh, that we were going to orbit around, right? We wanted to find an omega-1 and an omega-2 around uh, x and y, or e1 and e2. And uh, so there we came up with a solution to try and do both differential equations at once, which was um, omega 1 plus i times omega 2, or something like that, right? Same basic technique of combining two things into a complex exponential, where the two things are supposed to be independent. And because real and imaginary parts are independent, you can do it. But this isn't quite the same thing here because there there we were solving for two different variables um, in one complex equation here we're solving for just one variable but we are trying two independent solutions of the one variable at the same time right so it's a similar technique but we're not doing quite the same thing it's just just think about what do all these symbols mean? Whenever you're writing down this math, yes, you can manipulate the algebra and you can do all that. You can do calculus and do differential equations. But every so often you have to step back and say, wait a minute, what am I saying when I write down psi? And what am I saying when I write down phi and psi and all these things? All right. So anyway, just that as an aside. We're going to try psi 1 equal to that. I just want to note that psi 1 double dot right? Take a time derivative of the exponential, you're going to pull down an i omega. Take another one, you pull down another i omega. i squared is negative one, you get minus omega squared alpha one e to the i omega t plus delta one, right? So xi one double dot is minus omega squared xi, right? That's the simple harmonic oscillator equation there, right? I just want to note that because I'm going to use this when I substitute into the differential equation. So we're going to try um, this for xi one. And then we'll use that result that goes with that thing. Um, and then the equivalent thing for xi2, right? We're doing both of these at once. I haven't written out all the xi2 things, but it's the same. Replace all the ones with twos. This should have been a xi1 there. All right, so I do these substitutions. I have on the left side, m1, I need a color, m1 times xi1 double dot, which was just minus omega squared xi1, right, is equal to minus k1 plus k2 times xi1 plus k2 times xi2. And likewise, m2 times omega squared xi2, because xi2 double dot is minus omega squared xi2 is equal to k2 xi1 minus k2 plus k3 xi2. And now this is in the form 
such that I could write these as a matrix minus omega squared m matrix times xi vector, and I'll define that term in a moment. And I don't mean vector like a vector in 3D space, I mean a vector in the linear algebra sense of whatever the thing is equal to some k matrix times xi vector. And this works if we define all our various vectors and matrices and stuff like that as follows. Xi vector is equal to xi1, xi2. M matrix is equal to m1, 0, 0, m1, m2, rather. And then k matrix is equal to um, minus k1 plus k2, 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 minus k2 plus k3. And of course, I ran out of space there. All right. If I define those matrices, just do the matrix multiplication. If I define these matrices this way and I do the matrix multiplication, I will get those two equations out of it. And so the matrix is just a, a condensed way of writing those two equations. And the reason I could do that is because it was all linear. So matrices comes out of linear algebra. That's no accident. And I had some coefficient times xi1 plus some coefficient times xi2. And then the other equation I had some coefficient times xi1 plus some coefficient times xi2. I can put those coefficients in the matrix so that when I multiply the matrix by the xi vector, I get these equations out. And then on the left side, and of course, here's the thing. Um, on the left side, I, I want to have the xi in both places. Um, to get a column vector out, I would have had to multiply by um, a matrix, a two by two matrix. It works out that if you choose this matrix, that happens, right? So now that we have it in this matrix form, we can do stuff with this. Um, so let me clean up a little bit and rewrite the matrix equation. I've rewritten the matrix equation. I added omega squared m xi to both sides here. Um, so we have this because this is the thing that almost looks like the eigenvalue equation. What is the eigenvalue equation? Is some matrix times some vector is equal to some eigenvalue times the same vector, right? That's the eigenvalue equation. Um, Notice here that if I multiply a two by two, well, think two by two, this works with any square matrix, but a two by two matrix by a two element column vector, I'm going to get another two element column vector. And here's a constant times a two element column vector. Well, if I wanted to have matrices on both sides, and I do, I could have written this as lambda times the identity matrix times the vector, because the identity matrix times the vector is just the vector itself. And the identity matrix, remember, is just that. It is the extension of one. All right, so that is the eigenvalue equation. And using that, I could have written this as um, m minus i lambda on v is equal to zero, right? I could have written it that way. And then um, this, this is the eigenvalue equation. And so you'll notice I have almost the eigenvalue equation here, but not quite. All right, so what Taylor says is, well, all right, you can solve this the same way you solve the eigenvalue equation. You do the determinant and the characteristic polynomial, and you go nuts. Um, but I want to make it into the actual eigenvalue equation. So how can I do that? Well, I know here, basically, I want to have, I'm still going to have my omega squared here, because those are going to be my, the negatives of those will be my eigenvalues. Um, and... I want to multiply that by this, but I wanted this to be the identity matrix. Well, noticing that this is a constant, um, a, a single value, not a matrix, it's a number, single number, um, you can commute that through matrices. So I could put the omega squared later, so the second term could have become m omega squared xi, right? I, that's legal, that's allowed. And then if I wanted, instead of m, I wanted to have the identity matrix here, what I can do is I can pre-multiply the whole thing by the inverse of m because the inverse of m is defined as the thing that when you multiply it by m, you get the identity matrix. So what I'm going to do is pre-multiply this whole equation by m to the minus 1, and I will get inverse m, right, m to the minus 1. It doesn't really mean 1 over m. It means the inverse of m for matrix times k times xi plus omega squared i times xi is zero. And now it really is exactly the eigenvalue equation.
So if I can find the eigenvalues of this matrix, that's going to give me my omegas that solve this thing, right? The minus omega squareds are the eigenvalues of this matrix because this is the eigenvalue equation. Now, inverting matrices, often painful, uh, but it turns out this one's really easy to invert, right? The inverse matrix of M is just going to be 1 over M1, 0, 0, 1 over M2, right? Try multiplying that matrix by the M matrix, you'll discover you get the identity matrix. So in this case, um, inverting it is really pretty easy. And so when I do that, um, I get this matrix M to the minus 1K, which I'm going to define as K sub M, the KM matrix, right? Just so I have a name for it. Um, works out to be minus K1 plus K2 over M1, K2 over M1, K2 over M2, minus K2 plus K3 over M2. Close your brackets. Which, incidentally, if instead of, before I wrote the thing as a matrix, if I had divided both equations by the M, so divide one equation by M1, divide the second equation by M2, I would have come straight to this matrix, and I wouldn't have had to mess around with the inverse matrix. But whatever, this was actually one of the reading questions. How do you turn it into the actual eigenvalue equation? The answer is uh, pre-multiply the whole thing by the inverse of the mass matrix. And so now that we have that, we can actually do our um, eigenvalue equation to try and figure out what these omegas are. What are the frequencies that solve this? As well as um, what constraints can we set on these constants, alpha, delta, um, sorts of things. So let's do that next. So we're back here on Maxima. Um, and what we've got, all right, I load the matrix stuff. I define my mass matrix here, M matrix, blah. The matrix function in Maxima is a function where you give it a bunch of arguments separated by commas. Each argument is a list that is the row of the matrix, right? So that's what I get here. And I give it the, oh, and I invert it. Hey, look at that. I did it right. And I give it the K matrix here. Um, same thing, right? And then I want my xi vector. Now, this one's a little weird. I don't just do xi1, xi2, or matrix xi1, xi2. I want a column vector. See here, I get a column vector out. You have to do that in matrix by give it the first row as a list, so in brackets, then the second row. So that gives me my column vector. Um, now, I'm going to say, I'm just going to tell Maxima that uh, Xi1 and Xi2 depend on time, because they do. And um, here is the, just want to make sure that if we do the original matrix form, we get the same thing. Um, this you recognize as Xi1 double dot. So I get the equations, M1 Xi1 double dot equals, well, minus K2 plus K1, Xi1 plus K2, Xi2, but written in a different order here. So yeah, that's fine. But that's not the thing I actually really want to do. What I want to do is use this KM matrix, which is just the inverse of the mass matrix times the K matrix. There it is. It's the same thing that I had. Um, and now we can find the values of minus omega squared. So remember, in the eigenvalue equation, it's plus lambda I, and I had a Sorry, it's minus lambda i in that eigenvalue equation. I had plus omega squared. So minus omega squared are the eigenvalues, or the eigenvalues are minus omega squared. That's another way of saying that. Or minus the eigenvalues are omega squared. You know how to multiply by negative 1. So I'm going to use this function ui vex, right? That's actually really why I had to load um, eigen up here to get that package. So... Um, UI vex is a, and I don't want to show you yet because it's going to scare you. UI vex is the um, maxima thing that gives me eigenvalues and eigenvectors of a matrix all at once. And then the U version gives me unit vectors. And what do I get? I get something pretty big. Ooh. Wow. Ha 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 ha. He 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 he. In fact, notice the word conjugate in here. Oh my goodness, it's giving me complex numbers as answers. Actually, that's okay. Because remember, we had I's in our equations that went in. Um, they don't show up here, but they were there in the equation. So we can handle complex results. So the fact that there's a conjugate, that's okay. Which means if I take square roots and no negative numbers, that's okay. It's a complex equation. I can have I's in it. But oh my goodness, there's all this stuff here. Oh, and I don't think I've even run all these. So why don't actually here, let's just do it like this. Prepare for some spazzing. 
cell, evaluate all cells above. All right, it's going slow. I don't know what happened. All right, I'm going to interrupt, restart Maxima, and now Maxima should be purged and clean. And when I want to go down to here, um, let's do to here, uh, cell, evaluate all cells above, and it should happily get to there. And it did, and now I'm going to evaluate this, and it takes it a little while, but yeah, it gives this giant thing. And now, how do I pull stuff out of it? I mean, look, it's a list of a list of a list. And when you get to a later part, there's like lists of lists inside the list of lists of lists of lists, right? It was a list of a list of a list of a list. And so, <laughs> all right. So I've tried to organize how this works. So the outer list, right? So on the outside, there's a list. It's a list of lists. The outer list is a two element list, eigenvalue info, eigenvector info. That should be a C. Save this. Um, and then the eigenvalue info list. So if you unpack this list, it's a, um, look at all the spelling errors. It's a, uh, list of two lists. So the first is the eigenvalues. The second is the multiplicities. And remember, these are the actual things we're looking for, but sometimes you have the same eigenvalue with multiple eigenvectors. Here, it will only tell us, it'll only give each value once, and then it'll tell us the multiplicity is more than one. We won't end up with that in this case. And then the eigenvector list is a list of lists, eigenvectors, and it's the eigenvectors for the first eigenvalue, then eigenvectors for the second eigenvalue, blah, blah, blah. But this itself is a list, because if the multiplicity wasn't one, there could be multiple eigenvectors for the same eigenvalue. So you have to use the multiplicities to figure out how many there are. And then, right, so this is a list, it's a list of a list of a list, and then each eigenvector is itself a list with the components of the eigenvector. Huh. But looking at all this, you can sort of unpack it like this. So the eigenvalue info is, you know, result, the outer list, eigenvalue, eigenvector. Okay, fine. And then the eigenvalues... Well, um, I take, in fact, I should have said, it would have been clear if I had said EI val info, right? The eigenvalue info, um, the first element of eigenvalues is the eigenvalue info, and the second element of the eigenvalue um, info is the multiplicities, right? So if I hit that, I get all, um, all this, and here, notice you can't read the word multiplicities there, um, uh, EI val multiplicities, right? It's too long, but notice that it's one, one. So that's not so bad, right? But there's still a lot of junk in here. Um, whatever. And now I want to pull out the individual eigenvalues. So I have EI vowels and I've gotten it down to where I really have the two individual eigenvalues. And here they are. And notice, because I have square roots of stuff, um, actually, I don't think any of these square roots can ever be Imagining, and that's good. We have real eigenvalues, and we want real eigenvalues because they're supposed to be frequencies. So, hooray! But they're still long. I mean, here they are. If you if you don't make any assumptions about k1, k2, m1, m2 being the same as each other, hey, now you know it. Plug in the numbers. You're good. You have all the things that you want. But they're long. Those are values of omega. So now we're gonna uh, let's go ahead and go into the simpler case where k1, k2, k3 are all the same and m1, m2 are all the same. So I'll substitute in all k's. Right, k1 is k, k2 is k, k3 is k, m1 is m, m2 is m, into my eigenvalues, and I get these two things out. And oh, what's with these absolute values? Come on, it's a mass, it's a spring constant. We know they're constant. So all right, or we know they're positive. We'll tell them maxima. Hey, they're positive. Maximus says, okay, and now we'll do that substitution again. And now look at that, 3K over M and K over M. Those are minus omega squared. It's the same ones Taylor got, which means he did it right. <laughs> we were checking him because obviously I would never do it wrong. Um, great. So we have the two, although he did it in the other order. He, I think he called this the first one and this the second one, but whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, it's, a, it's a collection. It's not an ordered list. I mean, it's ordered for comparing the values to the vectors, whatever. Now we want to get the, all right, so we have the, the natural frequencies. Um, one of them is just this straight up spring frequency. Another one, well, oh, there's three springs, so maybe it's 3K. Now, don't think so facilely because you'll get messed up when you do other things. Um, but there you go. There's our natural frequencies. Let's get our eigenvectors out. So the first eigenvectors, I of X1 and I of X2, um, remember this these are the eigenvectors that go with the first eigenvalue. These are the eigenvectors that go with the second eigenvalue. There'll only be one in each case, but 
max, and just in case there was more than one maxim, it gives you a list of lists. And these are the long things with the conjugates in it. And oh my goodness, that's painful. And here they both are. Oh, 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 ouch, ouch. Okay. Um, and, and here I say, I actually want to just, let's go ahead and call it EI vect one. I'll actually pull out the first element, which is the only element because the multiplicity was one. And um, annoyingly, notice it gives me the components. There's a comma in here somewhere. I'm sure of it. I can't find it, but look for it. You can find a comma. If you look hard enough, you'll find a comma. It doesn't give me a column vector, which is really what I wanted. It gives me a list, two element list of the components. So I want to turn it into a column vector. And so here's I, how I do that. So um, right, EI VEX1, that is that first vector. I just say matrix, um, and I give the first component of the vector and the second component of the vector, and I, this will turn it into a column vector. And now, oh, let's, let's go ahead and just enjoy the length of it. There we are. Those are our two eigenvectors. They're long. Let's see if it really works. Well, I'm actually going to plug this long thing into the eigenvalue equation. So I'm going to take the first eigenvector, which should go with the first eigenvalue, right? I have pulled all these things out. The KM matrix, which is the thing these are supposed to be the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of. This is a period, not a multiplication. So that's a that's a, a, a period. Sometimes this start depends on how your maxima is configured. It'll render that as a dot, but a superscripted dot multiplication. So you have to so this is matrix multiplication. That, and I'm going to subtract this. I should get zero. And what I get is this, right? All this is not obviously zero. So let's ask Masco to simplify it. And it does. And look at, well, of course, it's not zero. It's the zero vector because it was a vector equation. But yes, so it works. So um, we have some confidence that it did the right thing. And now let's do the same thing we did for the eigenvalues. We will substitute in our simplified Ks. And we've already assumed above that K and M are both positive. And here we get our eigenvectors, one over root two minus one over root two, and one over root two, one over root two. Now, Taylor, I think, got one minus one and one, one. I, since I asked for the unit eigenvectors, that's why I got these. These are normalized, right? Um, so what this, what do, do these mean? Well, I say here, but I'm going to actually go back and start writing on the screen again as I talk about this. Okay, so now that we did all that, it's very easy to have lost sight of what the heck we were doing and why. So we ended up with the eigenvalues in, and normalized, and that'll be important, eigenvectors of this matrix. Uh, what does this all mean? Uh, well, so let's go back and make sure we know where we are. All right, so the eigenvalues and eigenvectors we got came from this equation, right? Mass matrix xi is equal to K matrix xi, right? Um, that was the, oh, I'm sorry. Well, all right, so this should have been minus omega squared, right? So that was mass matrix xi double dot, and then xi double dot is minus omega squared xi, right? Anyway, that was the, that this isn't exactly the eigenvalue equation, but multiply it by the inverse of the mass matrix, you get the eigenvalue equation. But these were our dynamical equations for our system. And then remember, we were trying um, xi in the form of um, psi 1 plus i, uh, phi one, right? That, that we were trying that in this equation. Really what that meant though, is that what we were trying is two different solutions at the same time to see how it worked. Um, that was psi one and then psi two had its own psi two plus i phi two. And then psi one plus i phi one um, was equal to, uh, well, psi one was alpha one cosine omega t minus delta 1, and phi 1 was alpha 1 sine omega t plus omega t minus delta 1, right? And like, likewise, psi 2 was alpha 2 cosine omega t minus delta 2, and phi 2 was alpha 2 sine omega t minus delta 2, right? And we wrote those so that um, uh, this xi1 could have been written as um, alpha1 e to the i times omega t minus delta 1. And xi2 could be written as alpha1 times e to the i omega t minus delta 2. 
that was an alpha two there, right? And this is a delta two. But these omegas are going to be the same as each other because that's what. Well, here's why these omegas are the same as each other. Really, because we saw we had just a single omega here. So uh, for the derivative to work right, they have to be exactly the same omega. Now, I do want to comment about units. Um, the What's going to happen when I try and compare this to the unit vectors is I'm, I'm going to not have an amplitude and I'm going to have unitless things. I'm going to just uh, multiply. So, you know, it's a linear equation, right? So if I multiply the whole equation by some constant, it doesn't, doesn't change the equation. And then I could factor that constant in and put it on xi. So I'm going to, I'll have an amplitude out front. The same amplitude goes on both of these, right? Um, so I'll have an amplitude that I can put out front that will go on those, and I'll have this same amplitude here. It's like, where was that before? Well, it was inside the alpha before, but because of the way I did the eigenvectors, um, I didn't actually put it in the alpha. So I'm going to put it out front here, and then we'll have it. All right, so these are the solutions that we have come up with. Um, well, okay, but what do, what do the eigenvectors and eigenvalues all tell us? Well, to do that, there's one other thing I actually need to do first. All right, so we'll start with these versions, and I'll clean it up and rewrite it. So great, we got the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of a matrix. What does it all mean? It's easy. All right, we just did a whole bunch of math. Where, what, what was that all about? Okay, so let's go back, remind ourselves how we got here. So remember, we started with this matrix equation, mass matrix times xi double dot vector, right? Where by xi vector, I mean the solution for mass one, the solution for mass two, and it's a joint, they're, they're linked differential equations. So one vector, one pair of these has to go together was equal to that K matrix times I. And those, we encapsulated the differential equations um, into these things. And then we said we were going to try a solution of the form. Uh, we were actually going to try two different solutions all at the same time. We were going to try a solution for Xi1. One. one solution we were going to try was going to be some constant, A times um, E to the I mega T minus delta, right? So we were going to try some constant, we'll call it a1 and delta1 here. We were going to try, some, I think it was alpha actually that he used, but whatever. We were going to try a solution in that form, but really what we were doing was trying two different solutions at the same time. We were trying a solution, xi1 is a1 cosine omega t minus delta1, and then we were also trying the solution, xi1 is a1 sine omega t minus delta 1, right? We were trying those two solutions at the same time. And that wasn't xi1. This was xi, this was xi, xi1 there, right? Both of these are xi1. We were trying two different solutions at the same time, <clears throat> which just means if I multiply this whole thing by y, i, and add them together, I get that because of this Euler thing, right? e to the i x is equal to cosine x plus i sine x, yet another thing named after Euler. Right, a useful thing, always remember that, e to the ix sinusoids. So really when I say that, we are trying two different solutions at the same time. And now there's a thing that, that gets obscured by the fact that we are trying two different solutions at the same time, is that this these two a1s don't actually have to be the same as each other, right? These two a1s don't have to be the same as each other. Um, interesting. But here's the thing, is that if I did that cosine omega t minus delta 1, what I'm going to want to do is factor a cosine omega t out. And I would have had to use the add angle formula, and it would have become cumbersome. Whereas factoring out from the exponential is really elegant. It's e to the i omega t, e to the minus i delta 1, right? So I'm going to stick with the exponential form for now. Okay? And what you can think about is that we are we are coming up with two different solutions. Um, one is the real part of this, and the other is the imaginary part of this. But then for each solution, we can choose, or choose at least, because they're actually going to be constrained by the differential equations. Um, we are going to determine these constants separately when we do the real part and the imaginary part, right? Uh, and the point is, I could, I could have just done the whole thing only with this cosine and done this solution one thing at a time, and it would not have... It would have obfuscated what's going on a little less, but the algebra would have been more painful because of cosine add angle formulas. Exponentials are just so much nicer to work with. So we're going to work with the exponentials, but be aware that 
um, when I, I coming up with two separate solutions and the actual solution can be a linear combination of those two solutions. Um, uh, these A1s then could have been different when I use one and, and they're going to be dependent on initial conditions and all of that. Now, likewise, I'm going to have Xi2 is equal to A2 cosine omega t minus delta 2 and Xi2 is equal to A2 sine omega t minus delta 2 written together, right? Again, multiply that whole equation by I and add them. You can say, oh, I'm going to try a Xi2 of the form um, A1 e to the I omega t plus delta 2, and that was an A2, right? Because it's I2, right? So, and then, and so we're going to try these together, and what's going to happen is we will discover that there are going to be links between the A1 and the A2, right? They're going to have to have, and there's going to be links between delta 1 and delta 2. Those things are going to have certain required relationships to each other. If you look at it right now, but remember, once again, these are two different possible solutions that we're going to try at the same time. And the whole argument I made before earlier is that um, if the sum of them works, um, well, if, the, if these each work individually, then the sum of them works as well, because we had the, you know, one of them was an imaginary part and one was a real part. Because they're two independent solutions, each one has to work all by itself. And because each one has to work all by itself, we could have different initial conditions in each case that give a different constant. So really, this A2 and this A2 could be different from each other. But then each A2 will have a relation to its chip to its A1. And now if you look at it, I seem to have eight independent constants here, right? I have this A2, this delta 2, and then this A2 that might be different, this delta 2 that might be different, right? A1, delta 2. But I only have the freedom for four constants. It's two linked second order differential equations. So a second order differential equation, you'll get two constants of integration out of it. I have two of them, I should have four constants. I have eight. What that means though, is that to fit in the equations, I'm going to get relationships between these constants. And in fact, I already have them um, because that's what the whole eigenvalue stuff is all about, all right? So let's come back to that. Right, so here we've got, this is the equation that we're trying this with. Um, I've written these things out in the way I want, and just uh, remember what we're going to have is xi1 double dot is going to equal uh, minus omega squared times xi1, a1 e to the minus i delta 1 e to the i omega t, and the same thing for xi2 double dot. I'm not going to write it out. You can handle it. It's, but these are the same omegas, right? These omegas are all the one omega. And so when I do that, what I'm going to get here is... Um, if I pull out an omega, I'm going to have minus omega squared m times xi is equal to k times xi. But then let's think about the xi vector. The xi vector is, this is going to be long, just handle it, um, a1 e to the minus i delta 1 e to the i omega t, a2 e to the minus i delta 2, e to the i omega t. Well, notice I can factor out a1 e to the minus i delta 1, a2 e to the minus i delta 2. I can factor out e to the i omega t, right? Because it's in both terms. And so that tells me um, if I had done that, then this equation, I'm running out of space again. One of these days I'll learn. No, you know, I'm never going to learn. This equation I could have written as, let's see if I can write it small enough to make it fit. Omega squared times, I'm going to write this for a vector, and I'll tell you what that is later. Um, e to the i omega t has to equal k vector, or k matrix times vector times e to the i omega t. So let's divide out the e to the i omega t. We have um, minus omega squared m on this, this vector that is... What vector? All right, this vector is this vector, right? That's because that's what was I was. So this these little brackets indicate that vector there. So what this says, and this is the thing that was almost the eigenvalue equation. Multiply both sides by the inverse mass matrix. It is the eigenvalue equation. That says the eigenvectors are these things, right? And so for a given omega, which is the eigenvalue, the eigenvectors are those, All right? So what does that tell us that our solutions are? Right. Well, one of our solutions, our first mode, was the one that where omega was root 3k over m, right? And remember, the eigenvector we got out was 1 over root 2 minus 1 over root 2, but that was a normalized unit eigenvector. So any constant 
times that eigenvector is still the eigenvector, right? This is a general truth for the eigenvalue equation, that if you have some matrix times a vector minus uh, uh, the eigenvalue constant times that vector equals zero, um, I can multiply that whole equation by some constant, and then I can factor that constant into the vector, right? Because it's just a scalar, so it, you can commute the multiplication there. You can't commute matrices, right? So any constant times that vector still satisfies the eigenvalue equation for the same eigenvalue. So this, what this really says is that um, uh, a1 e to the minus i delta 1 divided by a2 e to the minus i delta 2 has to equal negative 1, right? It tells me what the ratio of those two things are. Uh, it doesn't say a1 e to the i delta 1 has to be 1 over root 2. It says some constant times that, but then it has to be the same constant on the bottom. So you divide the two out. Anyway, so this is what that really says. Um, so that doesn't give us a lot of ways to figure out how all these things relate to each other. But notice, this is a real number. The eigenvectors could have had imaginary numbers in it. This is a real number. So one way to satisfy this, there's more than one way to satisfy this. Um, actually, here, I'll give you a general way to satisfy it. A general way that would satisfy this is if a2 is equal to minus a1 and delta 1 equals delta 2. That turns out that can encapsulate all the solutions we need, right? So they have to have the same phase and one of the amplitudes has to be the negative of the am other amplitude. That will satisfy it. So this tells us, putting these things together, that one of our solutions, omega is equal to root 3k over m, in that case, we have, and they have to go together, xi1 is equal to a, I'm just going to call it a, because we know how they relate to each other, minus i delta times e to the i omega t, and xi2 is equal to minus a, go away, go away, e to the minus i same delta, e to the i omega t, right? So the fact that this was the eigenvector set these constraints on this, and that tells us here is one pair of solutions that we have that goes with this normal mode. Here's this whole thing, e to the i delta. If delta is not 0 or pi, you're going to have an imaginary component, which is then going to mix with the other imaginary component. Really, we're going to have, yeah, it's going to mix with the other imaginary component. So a and delta are determined by initial conditions. And um, a and delta are determined by initial conditions. Depending on what delta is, you'll have a different amplitude on the other, on the psi thing. So really, um, if you linearly combine them together, the total solution, I'll use different constants here, is C times cosine omega t plus D times sine omega t for xi1, and for xi2, it's minus C cosine omega t minus F, skipping E because it looks like energy, sine omega t, right? And this, these were the two separate solutions we tried, but of course, a linear combination of the solutions are still solutions, and that shouldn't have been F, that should have been minus D, C, D, and C, minus C, minus D, right? So that xi2 is negative xi1, which is what we needed in this case, right? Um, and then C, D, C and D are determined by initial conditions. So this is one mode, and what is the initial condition? It's just what is the phase of the thing, right? Delta is the phase, that's your initial condition. A, how big is the amplitude. So this is one of the modes that we get. Um, all right, so that's how you use the eigenvalue equation. How do you think of, we've got this eigenvalue equation out. What does it really tell us? Um, it gives us uh, constraints on, on these amplitudes and these phases. And so we get, that's one solution that we have. So then if we do the same thing for the other solution, okay, so the other solution we had um, omega was equal just root k over m. Hey, that looks familiar. And the eigenvector we had, the normalized eigenvector was just 1 over root 2, 1 over root 2. Well, that says, that, so any constant we will call, not k, we've used k, we will call k tilde, because it's a, whatever, it's a constant, um, uh, times that is what we need to get for a1 e to the minus i delta 1. Now, this is for this second normal mode. We are forgetting about the first normal mode. We're now talking about the second eigenvector, the second normal mode, the second eigenvalue. It has to equal that. So... 
this tells us once again here again we have too much freedom because there's four constants and only one way to determine so a general way to do this is just say a1 has to equal a2 and delta 1 equals de delta 2 um, that'll do it right should have minus there um, so this tells us that the solution we right so because that's what the vector I told you earlier that's what the vector that was the eigenvector that we were finding um, and so this will work in, in that case. If you work that, then this constant is determined by whatever the initial conditions are. So this tells us now that our solution, our second solution is xi1 is equal to, um, let's, let's use, I'm going to use different letters here, f cosine omega t plus g sine omega t. Now, once again, why do I have the separate f and g? It's because um, if my delta is not zero, right? E to the I delta is going to equal cosine delta plus I sine delta. And when you multiply that by um, cosine omega T plus I sine omega T, you're going to discover that you, you're going to multiply this out. You're going to use a bunch of add and subtract angle formulas, and you're going to have, and remembering that delta is a constant, um, you're going to have a bunch of constants times cosine omega t plus a different bunch of constants times sine omega t. I'm just calling those bunches of constants f and g, not actually working it all the way out. And then the solution that goes with this, and is it has to be the same f. Cosine, basically, xi1 has to equal xi2 in this case. Right, that's what the eigenvector tells us. So that's our second solution. So now we have that's one of the solutions. The other solution was on the previous page. Now we have the two solutions, but it's not just the two solutions. These are the two eigenvector solutions. Um, and so then the general solution is going to be some combination of the two of these. And now notice we do have um, four vectors now, right? We had the A, B, C, and D from the previous page. Sorry, no, just the C and D, I already used A and B. So we had the C and D from the previous page and the F and G from this page. Um, those are our four constants determined by initial conditions. So a general oscillation, xi1 will be a linear combination of this and the other omegas. And then xi2 will be a linear combination of this and the other omegas, but it has to be the same combination, right? Because this F and this F are the same F as each other. So now we know what all these solutions are. So if you look at this first mode, so that's the mode where you have omega is root 3k over m and uh, psi 2, so the position of the second guy relative to its equilibrium, uh, is negative and psi 1 is positive times cosine omega t. So if you put those two things together, um, you get an oscillation that looks like this. So this is one of the normal modes and you'll see that they're exactly out of phase from each other. And in fact, one way of saying this, the thing that's really oscillating is the difference between the two positions. So that's one of the normal modes. Then the other normal mode, that was the one with psi equals uh, root k over m. So the frequency should be slower by a factor of root 3. So let's see if we actually see that when I plot it for real. And this is the one where you had the same sign on xi1 and xi2 times cosine omega t, or sine omega t, but I've chosen my initial conditions so that the sine term went away. The, the, dip, the sine versus cosine terms, it just comes in the multiple conditions. Right? And if you look at that, yes, it's oscillating slower as expected. And notice the two are exactly in phase with each other as expected. And in fact, this is the easiest normal mode to understand because the spring in the middle is always exactly at equilibrium. It starts at equilibrium, it stays at equilibrium because the... Um, Remember, xi1 and xi2 are the offsets from equilibrium. And if xi1 and xi2 are exactly the same as each other, because they're both a cosine omega t, that tells us that um, the difference between the second mass's position and first mass's position is the same as the difference between their equilibriums, which means the middle spring is at equilibrium, which means the middle spring is exerting no force. So this is exactly the same thing you get if you had the left spring and the left mass and the right spring and the right mass separately oscillating. It's just you happen to set them up to be in phase. That's just setting the initial conditions. And you get exactly the same frequency you would in that case, root k over m. So this is one of the normal modes. And then the other normal mode, which oscillates faster, has a higher frequency, is the difference of the two. So those are the natural frequencies the natural one of the natural frequencies is root k over m the other is root 3k over m and the normal modes are just how does it oscillate all right and then of course um 
how much you have of each mode, right? So again, these were two independent solutions. And always when you have two independent solutions, that means that any linear combination of those solutions is also a solution. So the two modes can freely mix, just depending on your initial conditions. Um, they can have different amplitudes, the same amplitudes, whatever. Well, here is an example where they have the same um, amplitude as each other, but, I, but I've mixed the two together. Um, you get oscillations like this, and hey, look at that. This is crazy. And if you think about the two modes, one mode has a period that is root 3 times the other's period, and root 3 is an irrational number. So one's period is not an even multiple of the other's period, which means this will never repeat, right? You're not ever going to get, so if you start with the two modes both in phase, you're not ever going to get them lining up again perfectly, right? So you'll just kind of have, this is not chaos because the equations are linear. It's not actually strictly speaking chaotic, but it's spastic, right? It's it's kind of oscillating around and the, the things, the oscillations are, are kind of wild and you can look in Taylor to see some plots of them. Um, so that's what it looks like when you mix the two modes. All right, now I know this video is getting kind of long. We're already like six minutes over an hour or something anyway. Um, there was a cat in the middle. Okay, I hope you saw that. It had music. Um, but there's one other thing I want to do, and that's what do these um, normal coordinates mean? Right? What are the normal coordinates? Well, okay, we can make an analogy to stuff we did back with rotational motion. So remember, back when we did rotational motion, we had, you know, you might have had some object, right, that could have been blobby shaped, right? And then we had the, I'm only going to draw X and Y, but, you know, there could be a Z here as well. Just easier to draw in 2D. We had X and Y, but it might have turned out that the principal axes, and looking at this, you can guess they're probably something like that. The principal axes are actually in those directions. So that might have been E1 and E2. How did we find what those principal axes were? Um, remember, what we did was we took the uh, moment of inertia tensor and we used it in an eigenvalue equation, right? Used it in an eigenvalue equation to figure out what directions, the vectors given by what directions would have um, a single moment of inertia, a principal moment of inertia around them. So for instance, in this case, we might have found E1 is 1 over root 2 x hat plus 1 over root 2 y hat, I just sort of drew it so it would be a 45 degree angle. So this is just an example, it could be anything, right? And then E2 could be minus one over root two X hat plus one over root two Y hat. You can dot these two and show that they really are uh, perpendicular to each other. Um, and then in the, these were the things, these were the um, unit eigenvectors I found were one over root two, one over root two, and minus one over root two, one over root two. Sound familiar, whatever. So um, in the same way, if you do a phase space diagram of Xi1 and Xi2, right? And so just to remind ourselves, Xi1 and Xi2, oops, that should be a spring, um, is the offset of this mass from equilibrium and the offset of this mass from equilibrium. Well, given that our two eigenvectors were um, 1, 1, or really 1 over 2, 1 over root 2, 1. This is generalized coordinate 1, and this was generalized coordinate 2, right, that we found, because the, actually, I think it's the other way around. I think this was 2, and this was 1, because that had the eigen, 1 had the eigenvalue 1 over root 2 minus 1 over root 2, whatever. So our generalized coordinates in the phase space of xi1 and xi2. So these are not really physically over here. These were just two physical axes. It was easier to understand, easier to visualize. This is more abstract over here. But in that phase space, that's, that tells you the generalized coordinates are linear combinations of these things. And, and sometimes that's sort of all you can do. But in this case, you can actually interpret them because eta1, remember, is 1 over root 2, it's just some scaling factor, um, times x2 minus x1, right? That was the difference. And I mentioned this when we were watching the thing oscillate. What was really oscillating in that first mode was the difference between the two things. Um, their center of mass was staying constant, and the distance between them is what was oscillating. So this generalized coordinate, what are the generalized coordinates? They are what oscillates in the normal modes. One of the normal modes had the difference between them oscillating. This one we could have written as 1 over root 2 times x1 plus x2 
bad space management, right? That's the second generalized coordinate. Um, and I actually, if I'm going to scale it a little differently, let's call it x1 over x2 plus 2, because given that these were the same mass, that's actually the center of mass. So when the two of them move together, it's like a rigid body moving around. So it's going to be an oscillation of the center of mass. So this is a case where the um, general coordinates, what are the things that oscillate? The center of mass and the distance between them. Those are the two things that oscillate in the normal modes. And what are the normal modes? Those are the normal modes where you get a nice clean sine wave out of it. And then the frequencies of the two normal modes are different from each other. Um, in a more complicated system, it won't be quite so easy to interpret exactly what these normal modes mean, but really they are the things that oscillate. And if you imagine, if you imagine going into phase space, it tells you how do you have to combine your physical coordinates, the positions of the things, with each other to get the things that really are what's oscillating. Okay, that was your introduction to coupled oscillators. These were the easy chapters, right? Wow, it's a big thing. That's all for now.